This is Night by Ellie Weasel, pages 45 through 55. The camp looked as though it had suffered an epidemic, empty and dead. There were just a few well-clad prisoners walking about between the blocks. Of course, we had to go through the showers first. The head of our camp joined us there. He was a strong, well-built, broad-shouldered man, bull neck, thick lips, frizzled hair. He looked kind. A smile shone from time to, from time, to time in his gray-blue eyes. Our convoy included a few children, 10 and 12 years old. The officer took an interest in them and gave orders for them to be brought food. After we had been given new clothes, we were installed into tents. We had to wait to be enlisted in labor units. Then we could pass into the block. That evening, the labor units came back from the work yards. Roll call. We began to look for familiar faces, to seek information, to question the veteran prisoners about which labor unit was the best, which block one should try to get into. The prisoners all agreed, saying, Buna's a very good camp. You can stand it. The important thing is not to get transferred to the building unit, as if the choice were in our own hands. The head of our tent was a German, an assassin's face, Fleshy lips, hands like a wolf's paws. He was so fat that he could hardly move. Like the leader of the camp, he loved children. As soon as we arrived, he brought them bread, soup, and margarine. Actually, this was not disin- this was not disinterested affection. There was a considerable traffic in children among homosexuals here, I learned later. The head told us, you're staying here three days in quarantine. Then you're going to work. Tomorrow, medical inspection. One of his assistants, a hard-faced boy with hodlgan eyes, came up to me. Do you want to get into a good unit? I certainly do, but on one condition. I want to stay with my father. All right, he said. I can arrange that for a small consideration. Your shoes. I'll give you some others. I refused to give him my shoes. They were all I had left. I'll give you an extra ration of bread and margarine. He was very keen on my shoes, but I did not give them up to him. Later on, they were taken from me just the same, but in exchange for nothing this time. Medical examination in the open air in the early hours of the morning, before three doctors seated on a bench. The first barely examined me at all. He was content merely to ask, Are you in good health? Who would have dared to say anything to the contrary? The dentist, on the other hand, seemed the most contentious. He would order us to open our mouths wide. Actually, he was looking for decayed teeth, but gold ones. Anyone who had a gold in his mouth had his number added to a list. I myself had a gold crown. The first three days passed by rapidly. On the fourth day at dawn, when we were standing in front of the tent, the co- the kapas appeared. And then, then each began to choose the men who suited him. You, you, you and you. They pointed a finger as though choosing cattle or merchandise. We followed our capo, a young man. He made us stop at the entrance to our first block, near the door of a camp. This was the orchestra block. Go in, he ordered. We were surprised. What had we do with music? The band played a military march, always the same one. Dozens of units left left for the work yards in step. The capos beat time, left, right, left, right. Some SS officers, pen and paper in hand, counted the men as they walked out. The band went on playing the same march until the last unit had gone by. Then the conductor's baton was still. The band stopped dead, and the capos yelled, Form Fives. We left the camp without music, but in step, we still had the sound of the march in our ears. Left, right, left, right. We started taking, talking to the mu- musicians next to us. We drew up ranks of five. With the musicians, they were nearly all Jews. Julek, a be- bespectacled Pole with a cynical smile on his pale face. Lewis, a distinguished violinist who had come from Holland. He, comp- he complained that they would not let him play Beethoven. Jews were not allowed to, to play German music. Hans, a lively young Berliner. The foreman was a Pole, Franick, a former student from Warsaw. 
Juliet explained to me, we work in the warehouse for electrical equipment not far from here. The work isn't in the least difficult or dangerous. But Idek, the capo, has bouts of madness now and then, when it's best to keep out of its way. You're lucky, son, smiled Hans. You've landed in a good unit. Ten minutes later, we were in front of the warehouse. A German employee, a civilian, the Meister, came to meet us. He paid us about as much attention as a dealer might, who had just received a delivery of old rags. Our comrades had been right. The work was not difficult. Sitting on the ground, we had to count bolts, bulbs, and small electrical fittings. The capo explained to us at great length the vast importance of our work, warning us that anyone found slacking would have him to reckon with. My new comrades assured me, there's nothing to be scared of. He has to save that because of the Meister. There were a number of Polish civilians there, and a few French women who were casting friendly glances at the musicians. Fronik, the foreman, put me in a corner. Don't kill yourself. There's no hurry. But mind an SS man doesn't catch you unawares. Please, I would have liked to be with my father. All right, your father, your father, be working here by your side. We're, we, we were lucky. There were two boys attached to our group, Yossi and TV, two brothers. They were Czechs whose parents had been exterminated at Birkenau. They lived body and soul for each other. They and I very soon became friends, having once belonged to a Zionist youth organization, often hummed tunes evoking the calm waters of Jordan and the majestic san sanctity of Jerusalem. And we would often talk of Palestine. Their parents, like mine, had lacked the courage to wind up their affairs and immigrate while there was still time. We decided that, if we were granted our lives until the liberation, we would not stay in Europe a day longer. We would take the boat for Hafi, Haifa. Still lost in his cab Kabbalistic dreams, a Kaaba drummer had discovered a verse in the Bible which, interpreted in terms of numerology, enabled him to predict the deliverance was due with the coming weeks. We had left the tents for the musician's block. We were entitled to a blanket, a washbowl, a, and a bar of soap. The head of the block was a German Jew. It was good to be under a Jew. He was called Apollos, Ap Al Ponce, a young man with an extraordinary aged face. He was entirely devoted to the cause of his block. Whenever he could, he would organize a cauldron of soup for the young ones, the weak, all those who were dreaming more about an extra plateful than of liberty. One day, when we had just come back from the warehouse, I was sent for by the secretary of the block. A7713, that's me. After eating, you're to go to the dentist. But I haven't got a toothache. After eating, without fail. I went to the hospital block. There were about 20 prisoners waiting in queue in the front of the in front of the door. It did not take long to discover what had been, why we had been summoned. It was for an extraction of our gold teeth. The dentist, a Jew from Czechoslovakia, had a face like a death mask. When he opened his mouth, there was a horrible sight of yellow, decaying teeth. I sat in a chair and asked him humbly, Please, what are you going to do? Simply take out your gold crown, he replied indifferently. I had the idea of pretending to be ill. You couldn't wait a few days, doctor. I don't feel very well. I've got a temperature. He wrink he wrinkled his brow, thought for a moment, and took my pulse. All right, son. When you feel better, come back and see me. But don't wait till I send for you. I went to see him a week later with the same excuse. I still did not feel any better. He did not seem to show any surprise, and I do not know if, if he believed me. He was probably glad to see me that I had come back of my own accord. As I had promised, he gave me an, uh, another reprieve. A few days after this, this visit of mine, they closed the dentist's surgery, and he was thrown into a prison. He was going to be hanged. It was alleged that he had been running a private traffic of his own in the prisoner's gold teeth. I did not feel any pity for him. I was even pleased about what had happened. I had saved my gold crown. It might, it might be useful to me one day to buy something, bread or life. I now took little interest in anything except my daily plate of soup and my crust of stale bread. Bread, soup, these were my whole life. I was a body, perhaps less than that even, a starved stomach.
the stomach alone was aware of the passage of time. At the warehouse, I often worked next to a young French girl. We did not speak to one another, since she knew no, ner no German, and I did not understand French. She seemed to me to be a Jewess. Though here she passed as Aryan, she was forced to labor deportee. One day, when Etik was seized with one of his fits of frenzy, I got in his way. He leapt on me like a wild animal hitting me in the chest, on the head throwing me down and pulling me up again, his blows growing more and more violent until I was covered with blood. As I was biting my lips to stop myself from screaming with pain, he must have taken my silence for defiance, for he went on hitting me even harder. Suddenly he calmed down, as if nothing had happened. He sent me back to work. It was as though we had been taking part taking part together in some game where we each had our role to play. I dragged myself to the corner. I ached, ached all over. I felt a cool hand wiping my blood-stained forehead. It was the French girl. She gave me her mournful smile and slipped a bit of bread into my hand. She looked into my eyes. I felt that she wanted to say something, but was choked by fear. For a long moment, she stayed like that. Then her face cleared, and she said to me, in almost perfect German, Bite your lip, little brother. Don't cry. Keep your anger and hatred for another day, for later on, the day will come. But not now. Wait. Greet your teeth and wait. Many years later in Paris, I was reading my paper in the metro. Facing me was a very beautiful woman with the black hair and dreamy eyes. I had seen those eyes before somewhere. It was she. You don't recognize me? I don't know you. In 1944, you were in Germany at Buna, weren't you? Yes. You used to work in the electrical warehouse. Yes, she said, somewhat disturbed, and then, after a moment's silence, wait a minute, I do remember. Idik, the capo, the little Jewish boy, your kind words. We left the metro together to sit on down on the terrace of, the, of a cafe. We spent the whole evening reminiscing. Before I parted from her, I asked, may I ask you a question? I know what it will be. Go on. What? Am I Jewish? Yes, I am Jewish, from a religious family. During the occupation, I obtained the forged papers and passed myself on as an Aryan. That's how I was enlisted in the forced labor groups. And when I was deported to Germany, I escaped the concentration camp. At the warehouse, no one knew I could speak German. That would have aroused suspicious suspicions. Saying those few words to you was risky, but I knew you wouldn't give me away. Another time, we had to load diesel engines on the trains, supervised by German soldiers. Eidek's nerves were on edge. He was restraining himself with great difficulty. Suddenly, his frenzy broke out. The victim was my father. You lazy old devil, Eidek began to yell. Do you call that work? And he began to beat him with an iron bar. At first, my father crouched under the blows. Then he broke in two. Like a dry tree struck by lightning, he and collapsed. I watched the whole scene without moving. I kept quiet. In fact, I was thinking of how to get farther away so that I would not be hit myself. What is more, any anger I felt at that moment was directed, not against the capo, but against my father. I was angry with him for not knowing how to avoid Idik's outbreak. This is what concentration camp life had made of me. Fronik, the foreman, one day noticed the golden, the golden tooth in my mouth. Give me your crown, kid. I told him it was impossible that I cannot eat without it. What do you, what do they give you to eat anyway? I found, I found another answer. The crown had been put down on the list after the medical inspection. This could bring trouble on both of us. If you don't give me your crown, you'll pay for it even more. This sympathetic, intelligent youth was suddenly no longer the same person. His eyes gleamed with desire. I told him I had to ask my father's advice. Ask your father, kid. But I don't want an answer. But I want an answer by tomorrow. When I spoke to my father about it, he turned pale, was silent a long while, and then said, "No, son, you mustn't do it. He'll take it out on us. He won't dare." But alas, Fronick knew where to touch me. He knew my weak point. My father had done military service, and had never succeeded in marching in, in step. Here, every time we moved from one place to another in a body. We marched in strict rhythm. This was Frenick's chance to torment my father and thrash him savagely every day. Left, right, punch. Left, right, clout. I decided to give my father lessons myself to teach him to change step and to keep the rhythm. We began to do exercises in front of our block. I would give the commands left, 
right, and my father would practice. Some of the prisoners began to laugh at us. Look at this little officer teaching the old chap to march. Hey, General, how many, rash, how many rations of bread does the old boy give, give you for this? My father's progress was still inadequate, and blows continued to rain down on him. So you still can't march in step, you lazy old devil. These scenes were repeated for two weeks. We could not stand any more. We had to give in. When the day came, Franek burst into wild laughter. I knew it. I knew quite well I would win. Better late than never. And because you've made me wait, that's going to cost you a ration of bread. A ration of bread for one of my pals, a famous dentist from Warsaw, so that he could have, so he can take your crown out. What? My ration of bread so that you can have my crown? Frenick grinned. What would you like then? I shall break your teeth with my fist? That same evening in the Levador... In the lavatory, the dentist from Warsaw poured, pulled out my crown tooth with the aid of a rusty spoon. Frenick grew kinder. Occasionally, he gave me extra soup, but that did not, not last long. A fortnight later, all the poles were transferred to another camp. I had lost my crown for nothing. A few days before the poles left, I had a new experience. It was a Sunday morning. Our unit did not need to go to work that day. But all the same, Artic would not hear of our our staying in the camp. We would have we we had to go to the warehouse. This sudden enthusiasm for work left us stunned. At the warehouse, Artic handed us over to Frannick, saying, "Do what you like, but do something. If not, you'll hear from me." And he disappeared. We did not know what to do. Tired of squatting down, we each in turn went for a walk through the warehouse, looking for a bit of bread some civilian might have left behind. When I came to the back of the building, I heard a noise coming from a little room next door. I went up and saw Idik with a young Polish girl, half-naked, on a mattress. Then I understood why Idik had refused to let us stay in the camp, moving a hundred prisoners so that he could lie with a girl. It struck me as so funny that I burst out laughing. Idik leapt up, turned around, and saw me. While the girl tried to cover up her breasts, I wanted to run away, but my legs were glued to the ground. Idik seized me by the throat. Speaking in a low voice, he said, You wait and see, kid. You'll soon find out what leaving your work's going to cost you. You're going to pay for this pretty soon. And now, go back to your place. Half an hour before work usually ended, the capo collected together the whole unit. Roll call. Nobody knew what had happened. Roll call at this time of the day? Here? But I, but I knew. The capo gave a short speech. An ordinary prisoner has no right to meddle in other people's affairs. One of you does not seem to have understood this. I am obliged, therefore, to make it very clear to him at once and for all. I felt sweat run down my back. A7713, I came forward. A box, he ordered. They brought him a box. Lie down on it, on your stomach. I obeyed. Then I was aware of nothing but the strokes of the whip. One, two, he counted. He took his time between each stroke. Only the first ones really hurt me. Then I could hear him counting. Ten. Eleven. His voice was calm and reached me as though a thick wall. Twenty-three. Two more, I thought. Half conscious, the capo waited. Twenty-four. Twenty-five. It was over, but I did not realize it, for I had fainted. I felt myself come round as a bucket of cold water was thrown over me. I was still lying on the box. I could just vaguely make out the wet ground surrounding me. Then I heard someone cry out. It must have been the capo. I began to distinguish the words he was shouting. Get up! I probably made some movement to raise myself because I felt myself falling back onto the box. How longed to get up? Get up! He yelled loudly. If only I could have answered him. At least, if only, I could have told him that I could not move, but I could not manage to open my lips.